Thank you very much, Roger. Well, it's a great honor to be here and an honor also to be introduced by uh, someone who I learned yesterday is one of the, the hundred movers and shakers of uh, Africa's industry, uh, mining industry, as uh, included in uh, a little um, uh, booklet that appeared in the delegates pack. So um, thank you very much, Roger. Um, and thank you very much for, for staying. I'm aware this overlaps with the, the tea break. I won't be remotely offended if some of you feel the need to go and grab yourself a cup. Uh, mine will be white uh, with uh, no sugar. Thank you very much. Now, people come into the mining industry for all sorts of reasons and by all sorts of routes. Uh, my own route into the mining industry is perhaps uh, slightly unusual in that I started out life uh, as a political scientist. Now, when I emerged from university in uh, 1977 with my newly minted PhD in political science, there didn't appear to be much uh, demand for my skills. Uh, the world was a bit more preoccupied with the uh, fallout from the, from the oil uh, crisis of those years, so I rebranded myself an economist and by a series of, uh, of happy coincidences found my way into the service of Her Majesty's Government uh, working on uh, mineral-related policy matters. After several years doing this, um, I eventually uh, recruited into um, Rio Tinto. But my interest in politics uh, remained. And as it turned out, the head office of a large multinational company based in London was a rather good vantage point uh, from which to watch the unfolding of world events. Politics shapes mineral supply in a variety of different ways. It determines where companies can invest, indeed if they can invest, the terms on which they can invest. But minerals also speak to people in some very profoundly political ways. These are not just commodities with utility, they're ut products with enormous uh, symbolic significance. Resource nationalism taps into the idea of minerals as national patrimony and the feelings that people have when they see their country dug up and carted away for use elsewhere. At the start of my career, the world we operated in is something called the Western world. Uh, it wasn't that we didn't know anything about China and, uh, and the Soviet Union, but they didn't massively impact on the markets that we were seeking uh, to analyze. As we got into the 80s, things began to change. In the latter part of the 80s, of course, uh, Eastern Europe shook off uh, the yoke of, of, of Soviet control. And in the early 90s, uh, the Soviet Union uh, began to implode. As a, just, just by chance, I happened to be uh, in uh, Moscow uh, the week before um, Mikhail Gorbachev was uh, deposed by a coup in August 1991. I was doing some research into try and find out, possibly rather too late, as to how the Soviet mining uh, system worked, and in w on which subject I subsequently wrote a, uh, a monograph for um, Chatham House, Royal Institute of International Affairs in London. But I never thought at that time uh, that one day uh, I would be working for a Russian company. Nor, I imagine, did you imagine that a Russian company would be a principal sponsor of this event, not so very long ago. Come the 90s, and then China emerged as the key issue for us to think about, and I spent a lot of time on the conference circuit in the latter part of the 90s, early part of the 2000s, talking about the implications of China, talking about the implications uh, uh, for our company, for Rio Tinto at the time, who we were working with, and for the, um, the, for the industry uh, more generally. Now, with growth in China, beginning to slow, or at least the rate of growth of demand for raw materials beginning to slow, with companies beginning to pull in their horns with respect to investment, we move into a new chapter in the life of the industry. And it seems like a good time to explore uh, questions about how uh, global supply in the industry is changing and how it will change in the future. More specifically, I want to ask the question, how is politics shaping world minerals industry? And this is my subtitle. Now, 
the proximate cause of many of the changes that are taking place in the minerals industry is uh, captured in this simple chart. If one goes back to the beginning of the last decade, 2000, 2002, no one was much interested in the mining industry. It was a pretty unprofitable place to be. Um, uh, investors were much more interested in uh, technology. And governments were not much interested uh, in the development potential uh, of the industry either. Of course, as we moved on to that upslope of, of, uh, of the price, 2004, 2005, um, mining once more became an object of desire. Companies started to become much more profitable. For the first time in a very long time, young people started to be drawn into the mining industry. Investors started to talk about a multi-year, uh, multi-decade uh, super cycle. And unsurprisingly, government started to get interested in the potential of this industry as well. And the first conclusion that governments came to was that they were not getting enough of the benefit of this price cycle. So taxes and levies started to increase. Just over a year ago, uh, Deutsche Bank did a piece of research which posed the question, where did the profits go during the price cycle, during the, 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 the price boom? And uh, part of the answer is contained in this chart, which shows the cumulative returns of major stakeholders over the 2005 levels. And it shows that the uh, share going to government was uh, the biggest beneficiary during this process with an increase of over 400%. In a sense, you can say this is how things are supposed to work. A disproportionate amount of the benefit is supposed to go uh, to governments. Their, their take should be leveraged to the cycle, but this obviously also reflects increase in the rates of take uh, uh, as well. Second major group of beneficiaries, uh, senior management. Well, no surprise there. Um, the group that came out of this worst, rather depressingly, were the shareholders, the equity holders. A circumstance that Deutsche Bank puts down uh, to the fact that they have less leverage over the net revenues of the company uh, than the other groups. The only real sanction uh, the shareholders have uh, is to walk, take their money elsewhere. Now, at the same time that governments were beginning to get interested in, in the mining and the, and the revenues of mining, uh, so consuming countries were also beginning to get uh, rather interested in these issues uh, as well, since um, prices were rising to a point where they were beginning to threaten their own uh, capacity to grow their economies. Now, some of this obviously is cyclical. Uh, interest in minerals tends to ebb and flow uh, with the price cycle. But I'd like to suggest to you that it's a lot more than that, that we're unlikely to see as prices come down a reversion to traditional patterns of behavior, and that some of what we're seeing here is rooted in a much more fundamental structural shift in global supply picture, one that had been in train for some considerable time. One aspect of this is captured in this rather interesting chart that comes from uh, a series that Goldman Sachs produced on the revenge of the old economy. I thought this was a rather uh, interesting chart, and it captures, uh, so purportedly, the percentage of global surface area controlled by superpowers, and it shows, predictably, uh, how uh, this part of the, the globe cap, uh, covered by uh, superpowers grew through the imperial era, the colonial era, era, and indeed into the Cold War era. But it also shows how political power has fragmented dramatically in the last few years and taken us back to a situation similar to that which existed in the latter part of the 17th century, a period when mercantilism was the prevailing political and economic philosophy of the day. Now, this fragmentation of political power, from the point of view of democracy, one has to say, is a thoroughly good thing. More countries than ever before in the history of the world, or at least since the 17th century, have the power of self-determination. 
However, from the point of view of mineral policy, it's a bit more complex than that. It means there are more people now involved than ever before in the determination of mineral policy. In this more fragmented world, so Goldman Sachs argues, uh, cross-border investment becomes increasingly challenging. That investments are more uh, disposed to go uh, to where uh, to, to accessible resources rather necessarily than to the better quality resources. As a result, investment becomes inefficient, uh, costs become higher in the industry, margins smaller, and long-run prices become higher than they might otherwise do. And this, uh, the Goldman Sachs says, we may not have a resource problem, but potentially over the long term we might be confronting an investment problem. The world they describe has some interesting echoes with that earlier period of mercantilism. Mercantilism as a political philosophy was a very nationalist philosophy. It was an economic philosophy of each country for itself. It um, flowed from the idea that economics was essentially uh, a zero-sum game and that the uh, best way in which a country could enrich itself uh, was by the promotion of exports and the suppression of imports. By this means it could leverage its own development at the expense of others. And one of the champions of this uh, thinking uh, was uh, uh, Jean-Baptiste uh, Colbert, who was the rather formidable uh, Minister of, of Finance under Louis XIV. Clearly, this kind of thinking runs completely counter to the thinking that, ar that later arose in relation to um, competitive, comparative advantage and theories of David Ricardo, and the idea that um, free-flowing markets work to the benefits of everyone uh, over the long term uh, and lead us naturally into globalization and multilateralism. Where I'm saying we have interesting parallels with the earlier period is the emphasis on nationalism and on protectionism. Now to those insights from Goldman Sachs I want to add uh, one of my own. A lot of their insights are very much focused on the oil industry. Uh, I want to extend the analysis uh, elsewhere and into uh, non-fuel minerals. And the point that I want to make is this, that historically producers and consumers of minerals were often the same countries, that there was a major overlap between producers and consumers. If one goes back to the Industrial Revolution, a lot of the raw materials for Europe's industrialization came from within Europe. A lot of those from the US came from within the US. And even in the later period, they came from areas controlled by those countries. And this provided a clear self-interest in consumer countries in mine development because they were looking uh, for cheap raw materials uh, as consumers. Now, this becomes less and less the case with time. The overlap between producing and consumer countries is gradually diminishing. Now, partly this is a product of the fact that a lot of the growth in demand over the last decades has come from countries without major raw material bases, like uh, Japan, China, uh, Korea, uh, and Taiwan. It also reflects the fact that more and more of the production has become focused uh, in countries which are net exporters of raw materials um, in Latin America, Africa, Oceania, and Central Asia. This process of polarization of supply being obviously facilitated somewhat by um, developments in bulk transportation. Now the point that I want to make is illustrated in this uh, graphic, which is really key uh, to my presentation. For the purposes of drawing this graphic, I've divided the world into, rather crudely into consuming countries and producing countries. Within the consuming group, I'm talking North America, uh, Western Europe, um, uh, Japan, China, and uh, the former Soviet Union. And in the producing group, talking of Asia, less China and Japan, uh, Africa, Latin America, and Oceania. Now, the breakdown is, is, is subject to, to 
criticism, I'm sure. Uh, the consuming, but the consuming countries have, over the period, this 50-year period of this chart, uh, consumed over 75% of the minerals of the world, and over some parts of that period, over 95%. And I don't think that those kind of uh, issues really challenge the basic point uh, of the analysis, which is that in each and every case, the proportion of global supply coming from, produce, from consuming countries has diminished by half or more. In the case of bauxite, copper, iron ore, and nickel. I include oil here where the decrease has been much less, but where in a sense uh, oil was already there. Will this continue? Well, if the distribution of reserves, and I've broken out the world reserves as presented by the US Geological Survey amongst the same two groups of countries, and they show something like 75% uh, of the remaining reserves in those countries that I've designated producing and exporting countries. Now, this polarization of supply changes the dynamics of markets in some rather fundamental ways. It undermines that natural coexistence of interests that, that, that arises where the major producers and the major consumers are in the same country. It also results in the politicization of mineral production and what I call the securitization of consumption. Producers are no longer as focused on the simple question of how do we supply cheap raw materials, but how do we use minerals as the basis for our national economic development? An objective which might well be served by higher rather than lower mineral prices. Consumers not unnaturally see this as a threat to their interests with restricted availability and higher prices imposing constraints upon their ability to develop their economies. And so minerals in this context start to become an issue of national security, economic security and military security, and what, thereby what political scientists refer to as securitization of mineral consumption. This gives rise to a conflict, potentially a mercantilist style national based conflict between those with resources and those who want to have the benefit of the products that they produce. Within this context, actions by the one group can be seen as hostile uh, by the others. Even issues in Europe which are taken as being self-evidently good, like uh, encouraging a resource efficiency, recycling and so on, can from a certain perspective be seen as a direct challenge to the ability of other countries supplying those minerals to leverage their own development through the export and production of those products. In other words, to dramatize it perhaps slightly, we're looking down the barrel of a new mercantilism, a view that challenges the assumption that the free market is always and everywhere the best way to organize our affairs. And it makes for a, a, a relatively more, uh, the, it makes for uh, markets where inherently more political, more like oil, in fact, which has uh, for many years now had a fairly entrenched uh, political character. Now, this is a rather substantial claim, so most of the rest of my talk I'll be trying to elaborate this and discuss it uh, with respect to uh, producing and consuming countries, starting with producing countries. As production shifts from, produce, from, from consuming to producing countries, so the calculus of what shapes investment begins to shift. Shift away from simple business considerations towards a whole range uh, of other broader considerations, some of which uh, are captured in this uh, slide. How is a mining project can be used to leverage development in other sectors of the economy? What might be a project's impact on income levels and income distribution? How might the project's impact on the currency exchange rate affect other economic sectors? How communities in the vicinity of projects feel about the project? How many jobs are cre created? How will the environmental impacts of the, what will be the environmental impacts of the project and whether the project to be produced should go for export or retained in the country for further processing or indeed even left in the ground. Now while all of these issues have a clear economic dimension, many of them represent aspects of political choice. 
and there are aspects of political choice in which the state, as the guardian of the national interest, is likely to want to be involved. Indeed, as the agenda of the mining industry shifts further away from a strict focus on resource quality and geology and so on towards broader policy issues like sustainable development, impacts on communities and so on. So the range of issues with a political dimension that impinge on decision making in the mining industry gradually grow in time. Growth in information and communication technologies also plays a part here in providing more information to those who are interested in these developments and want the opportunity to express their views on what's going on. Now, against this background, producers naturally becoming more assertive in their attitude towards the terms and conditions on which their resources are developed, uh, an assertiveness which is often captured in the terminology of uh, resource nationalism. Now, I mentioned already uh, increases in taxes and royalties as one of the manifestations of, of resource nationalism, and I'm sure there will be much discussion of this issue over the course of the next a couple of days, and I'm not going to elaborate beyond these, these points, but some of the other issues, other manifestations, uh, more costly demanding permitting conditions, use it or lose it type provisions to encourage the rapid development of, of resources, stricter requirements of social investment, restrictions on foreign ownership, preferment of local companies, the requirement for state and indigenous shareholdings something that we've seen much more of in recent times, and indeed discouragement of local firms from investing overseas on the ground that mineral-rich countries should uh, encourage their companies to stay at home rather than what might be seen as exporting jobs to other countries. Interestingly, a little digression here, if one compares this phase of resource nationalism to that which occurred right back at the beginning of my career in the 1970s, uh, there is much less of an emphasis here on the direct involvement of the state. Clearly the state is involved in many respects, but state ownership doesn't uh, seem to be at the top of uh, many countries' um, objectives at the moment, possibly because uh, the last experience of state ownership proved not to be so successful, but perhaps also because um, indigenization is seen as making that somewhat unnecessary. Um, governments may feel that um, indigenous investors give them uh, the, the leverage they need over the activities uh, of those companies and makes state ownership uh, unnecessary. It's interesting in, in Russia, for example, that uh, whilst the state has become directly involved uh, in, in the oil and gas sectors to quite extensive degree, they've not felt it necessary to become significantly involved in uh, ownership in the mining sector. This is a chart um, I borrowed from control risks that shows uh, the very widespread um, incidence of resource nationalism, and this covers oil and gas as well as the mineral sector, but it's, I, I, I put it before you simply to show that this is a pretty much a global phenomenon, uh, big focus in resource producing countries, obviously, Latin America, um, Africa, Asia. Australasia. This is not confined to emerging markets. This is evident in uh, it's very much an active uh, issue of debate in Australia subsequent to the, the mineral uh, resource rent tax and indeed in Canada uh, where um, BHP Billiton's um, uh, pitch to um, uh, acquire Potash, um, Potash Company of, Canada, of Saskatchewan uh, was blocked by the Canadian government. But if some Sorts of, uh, but these sorts of, uh, of resource nationalism may be uh, more diverse, nuanced than, than historically. The fact is, this is becoming, and rem or has remains, and may be becoming more um, an issue shaping where countries will invest in the world. And we've already had uh, uh, the, the Honourable um, Mayor, in her introductory remarks, pointing out that a large country like South Africa, known to be very minerally rich, has been attracting much less investment than one might otherwise have expected to be the case. Um, Ernst & Young uh, do an annual uh, survey on business risks 
facing mining and metals in addition to providing the, the ribbon uh, that's holding up my uh, name tab. Um, and this um, business risk survey uh, over the last uh, few years is quite revealing in terms of perceptions about uh, resource nationalism. Um, it gradually rises up uh, the table uh, through 2008, 2010 and becomes uh, the overriding business risk, perception of business risk in 2011, 2012, pushing down the ranking more obviously commercial considerations like uh, skills shortages, uh, capital management and so on. But also um, one can see uh, other what one might regard as political um, issues creeping um, onto the agenda in that last year. Uh, maintaining social license to operate, sharing benefits from mining, fraud and corruption creeping onto the, the, uh, the list uh, in that last year. Another way in which um, mineral rich countries have been asserting, seeking to assert their influence um, is, is through uh, requirements for local beneficiation. This is another thing which we've already heard reference to. Um, either by uh, making it a direct condition of mine development or uh, encouraging it through the use of export restrictions. Now, when the um, rules governing global trade, uh, the General Agreement uh, on Tariffs and Trade, GATT, uh, were drawn up, um, no one really thought much about export restrictions. The focus was almost exclusively on import restrictions and the use of import restrictions to protect uh, countries manufacturing products from uh, competition uh, elsewhere. So the GATT uh, has very little to say on the subject of, of export restrictions. It may have been simply that, that they couldn't imagine at the time why anyone would want to uh, restrict their exports. However, the non-renewability of minerals and a growing uh, inclination for countries with those minerals to conserve their resources, as well as this interest in how you maximize the benefit of your minerals has led to a, renewed in, to a new interest in the use of export restrictions. I guess one shouldn't underestimate either the enormous symbolic significance of OPEC, which of course does exactly this. In 2010, the World Trade Organization devoted its annual report to the natural resources trade. And it pointed out that um, growth in natural resources had grown dramatically over the course of uh, the previous decade um, in absolute terms, but also interestingly, it was growing in terms relative to other forms of trade. And this reversed a very long-term tendency. The other point that the, the report made was that although the incidence of trade restrictions is less in the area of natural resources than in manufactured products, in the area of export restrictions, uh, there are more examples of this within the natural resources area. And this chart, which also comes from uh, that report, um, partially illustrates that. On the, on the right hand side, you can see um, the incidence of export restrictions or export taxes specifically in this case because there are other forms of export restriction like quotas and uh, licensing arrangements and so on but this is focused specifically on export taxes and it reckons that something in the region of 12% of global trade at the harmonized standard two digit level is subject to uh, export restriction uh, in, in uh, frequency terms about six in every 100 product. And one explanation that WTO offers for this is that producing countries are looking, if you like, to level the playing field, to counteract the effect of the imposition of uh, import taxes by countries seeking to protect their manufacturing industries, but also uh, their smelting industries, because of course some of these restrictions have been used um, in the past to, by uh, met metallurgical industries um, to protect smelting industries imposing import restrictions on refined metals whilst importing, uh, whilst not imposing any restrictions on processed, on, uh, on unprocessed materials. 
at about the time that the, the World Trade Organization was publishing this report, a group of countries, uh, the US, uh, European Union, and Mexico, were in the course of bringing uh, a case, and it was a test case effectively, uh, against China um, for imposing export restrictions on a batch of nine uh, minerals, including uh, refractory bauxite, fluorspar, uh, magnesium, amongst others. Now, the World Trade Organization found against China I in this case, um, essentially on the grounds that uh, it found that uh, China had been acting in contravention of the terms of the succession treaty, in terms of succession treaty by which it came into the WTO at the end of 2001. But what is quite interesting is that when one reads uh, the, the details of the case, in the preamble to its defense, China effectively lodges a political defense of its case, which is to say um, it argues that this is a matter of sovereignty. It is a, a matter uh, um, of uh, real jurisdiction over how a country disposes of its natural resources, a right that is well established uh, through numerous resolutions of uh, the United Nations. And I think that means this issue still um, hangs out there. Now, a number of countries are looking at the use of uh, export taxes to uh, encourage uh, beneficiation. Um, perhaps the most high-profile uh, example around at the moment is that of Indonesia, which uh, early last year uh, announced that it was imposing a 20% uh, export tax on all um, exports of unprocessed raw materials, or 65 listed uh, unprocessed raw materials, and that the export of these products would be banned uh, as from 2014. Companies uh, were required to bring forward uh, plans for domestic processing of these raw materials, and in fact only those that came forward with such plans were allowed uh, to export at all. Other aspects of the initiative uh, related to the ownership of mining uh, assets in Indonesia uh, with a proposal that um, foreign investors be uh, gradually uh, phased down to 49% ownership uh, over the course of the next uh, decade uh, and several contracts of work amongst existing investors being reopened. Now, how far this, this goes, whether it is carried through to the letter, um, there is still a lot of debate in Indonesia uh, over this, indeed the constitutionality of some of these provisions, but nonetheless there is no doubting what the intention of these policy initiatives are and what it is uh, that the government is seeking uh, to achieve through its actions. Now, up till now, I've talked extensively about the act, the role of producers and their act, uh, their, their uh, impact on the reshaping of mineral supply. I just want to have a few words now on the position of consumers in this world because they too are helping to change this supply picture. And in this chart, I show uh, mine production in some of those um, countries that I earlier designated consuming countries. Um, and what is apparent from these uh, charts, copper, nickel, uh, iron ore, is that mine production in Western Europe and North America, at any rate, uh, has been something less than entirely dynamic over the course of the last 20 or more years. And in fact, uh, it is flatlined in many respects, some cases actually declined. And this is in absolute terms, so as a proportion of global um, production, their share has diminished significantly in line with the thesis that I'm offering you. Now, to some extent, this is to be expected, and, and given that, I've, as I've already pointed out, a large part of the resources lie uh, outside of these regions. But I'd also like to suggest that, to some extent, this is also um, an expression of political choice in these areas. Now, I don't imagine that the, these countries would uh, necessarily admit it, but they really haven't tried very hard to encourage or retain mining in these areas. And there are some good reasons for it. The, the pressures on land use, the pressures from the environmental lobby make this uh, a politically rather difficult industry for these governments uh, to, um, uh, to manage. But this itself is an aspect of political choice and they are contributing towards this shift in the location of industrial production that I've outlined. Situation in 
Russia is, is slightly different and probably reflects uh, the, the uh, investment uh, environment in, in Russia. I think there's a will there to, uh, to, to grow production there, but so far the investment has really not been uh, forthcoming. However, the growing import dependence of the consuming countries, or specifically U uh, Western Europe and uh, US, that has, is a product of these shifts, uh, whilst uh, they may have made a contribution towards that situation, it's not a matter of indifference, as we've seen over the last few years. And uh, the issue, if I talk about critical minerals, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about here. There have been a, a, a whole a raft of studies conducted in the United States, in Europe, on the question of the vulnerability of these regions to supply disruption um, with respect to the import of uh, critical minerals. A study from the National Research Council in 2008, uh, a study from the European Commission um, in 2010. But it has to be said that for all these expressions of concern, there haven't been a lot of policy initiatives that have flowed as a result of this. There have been exhortations to improve resource efficiency. There have been some funding for additional research, but nothing much in the area of uh, real um, policy uh, response, a fact which may not un be unrelated to the fact that uh, industrial uh, production has been pretty sluggish in these areas uh, and that governments are obviously uh, stressed with their funding as a result of high levels uh, of public debt. The situation in China, of course, the other major element in amongst these consuming areas, is very different. Not only has their demand been growing very fast, it now represents a major part of global demand, but it has become increasingly concerned over time that a restriction on its raw material supply would represent a significant um, ob obstacle to its own economic development. Now, as a result of some of, the, some of these pressures, something quite interesting happened in the industry, and this has been alluded to uh, already at one or two points uh, in the earlier presentations, and that is that the industry saw a huge uh, wave of new, small-scale, lightly capitalized, labor-intensive, high-cost producers coming into the industry to plug the gap that had arisen in supply and to prevent uh, the unavailability of raw materials from acting as a break upon uh, China's development. Now one can debate the extent to which China actually, uh, Chinese policies actually encourage uh, these developments, but it took a pretty permissive uh, attitude towards them because it was in its interest to see this production uh, come about. And this has had quite significant impacts um, at a global level. Uh, Iron ore, we've already talked a bit about iron ore. This is a, a chart that shows the share of global uh, iron ore, um, uh, the share accounted for by the big three producers, both um, of seaborne trade and world production. And it's quite evident that the, the share accounted for by um, the big three producers grow, grew fairly consistently um, from 1980 through uh, to the early 2000s, at which point their share has been diminished as other producers have forced their way uh, into this industry. If one looks at uh, the uh, production of iron ore in China, uh, one can see how uh, for the early years of this chart that uh, Chinese production uh, rumbled along at about 100 million tons a year. And th this 100 million, by the way, is a standardized 62% FE, the basis on which one can compare Chinese production with production elsewhere in the world, before rising strongly to about 400 uh, million tons. And I'm indebted to uh, Magnus Ericsson for these data sitting down here at the front, um, before diminishing back to about 300 million tons. Um, how much of this has a long-term uh, life expectancy? It's difficult uh, to know, but nonetheless, uh, my, my personal guess would be that uh, in, in 10 or 15 years' time, China's production will probably have uh, has reversed back to this kind of 100 million ton level that it had historically.
Two other commodities where China has had a huge impact on uh, the global pattern of supply are these two, aluminium and nickel. Now, these were commodities in which China was not considered to have any very obvious competitive advantage with respect to production. Its uh, bauxite is not generally very suitable for metallurgical purposes. Its reserves of nickel are very limited, and yet in both these cases it has emerged as the world's largest producer, accounting for 45% of the world's production of aluminium, around about 30% its production of nickel. The competitive advantage on which this is based is low cost of capital, technological innovation, but the raw materials for this are almost entirely imported. Nickel imports from uh, Indonesia, uh, Philippines, and uh, New Caledonia. And the result of this buying practice has seen a revitalization of the trade in bauxite and nickel ore, both of which were, I think it's reasonable to say, uh, not so very long ago uh, deemed to be uh, dying businesses as internationally traded products. Not so now, not so over the last few years. Um, 2012 represents a kind of interesting diversion because uh, of the imposition of those export restrictions from Indonesia that I mentioned seems to have led to an acceleration of buying um, of nickel ores in, in, uh, as a preemptive move ahead of the tightening of those restrictions in future years, whereas in the case of bauxite it seems to have choked off some of the demand and pushed that demand back uh, towards alumina as an import product. But I think this represents quite an interesting uh, microcosm of a broader issue. Uh, policies of, uh, for procurement by a consuming country running head-on into uh, the policy initiatives of a producing country to maximize the benefit of uh, its own raw materials to its local economy. Uh, the final point on, on China here, obviously another means by which it's seeking to secure its long-term supplies are through um, overseas investment in mining, uh, something which uh, has grown very strongly since uh, 2004 when the, the policy of going out, as it's described, was extended uh, into the minerals area. Uh, this again is something which is going to be uh, much talked about, I'm sure, over the course of the next a uh, couple of days. At the moment, um, mining uh, accounts for about 20% of China's foreign direct investment, uh, with Africa and Australasia uh, at the top of the list of company, countries where that um, is, uh, is directed, um, but also um, Latin America, uh, other parts of Asia on that list. Um, the original focus of these investments was tended to be uh, iron ore, copper, nickel. Uh, more recently, um, uranium, uh, coal, and uh, copper uh, and uh, gold have been added to that list. But at a point which uh, Magnus also made is that though much talked about, and, and although this is likely to be a major issue for the future, it's a little bit premature uh, to be emphasizing the impact that this has already had on global supply patterns. It is an issue for the future. So what do these developments and the politicization of minerals discuss imply for the future? Well, as minerals, mineral markets begin to balance, as some of the pressure goes out of some of these markets, as China begins to reorient its economy away from investment rich to more cons uh, consumer driven growth, probably some of the more acute concerns amongst consuming countries about the availability supply uh, will dissipate. Probably also some of that high cost capacity high up the tail uh, of the cost curve will uh, begin to close down. And again, in China, there are quite some, already some signs of a quite determined uh, policy um, initiative to close down some of the higher cost, uh, more polluting small scale producers that are deemed no longer to be perhaps so essential to uh, the national economic project. And this will uh, allow some of the larger, more traditional investors with, able to exploit economies of scale in terms of their cost structures to reclaim some of the market share that they've lost over the last few years. But it also creates opportunities for new large-scale projects to be launched 
in parts of the world uh, which have uh, those large-scale ore bodies, as uh, Africa does in abundance across the range, iron ore, copper, nickel, uh, mineral sands, gold, and so on. However, I do not believe that we're going to see a complete reversal of these tendencies uh, towards politicization in the way that we did after the resource boom of the 70s. And the reason I don't think we will, because I think the geopolitical context is completely different from that of the 1980s. In the 1980s, we had uh, almost a, a single power world, and the, the Soviet Union was becoming economically weak at that stage. US economy was extremely dominant in the world, along with its philosophy of liberal capitalism. The world we inhabit at the moment is very different. Uh, we are moving into a multipolar world, a, a world where many countries look to the Chinese development model as more useful, more relevant to their situation, which is to say a world where the state plays a much stronger role, not necessarily in the ownership of um, uh, the economy, but in terms of the direction, coordination of national uh, economic development, a notion which sometimes people refer to as state capitalism to distinguish it from liberal capitalism. How far will this process go? And how will it be managed? Well, this obviously is a huge issue for people in the mining industry at the moment, and it's one that I think it's fair to say that no one has uh, any very clear ideas on how it's going to work out. There's a lot of uncertainty around this. Um, as, as I've argued, there are more decision makers in, in, in the uh, making mineral policy than, than we've had historically. And as one moves from a kind of rules-based system uh, towards a more negotiated kind of context for these things, it removes certain fixed points uh, of reference, which for a capital-intensive industry like mining is uh, a very serious issue. It's also, incidentally, a major seri serious issue for forecasters. Um, but anyhow, the, some of the characteristics of this world um, I uh, outline here. One of them is we're likely to see more strategic investors in the industry. This politicization is already finding expression in uh, non-commercial uh, investments, whether these are by consumers looking to uh, secure their supplies of raw materials, state organizations looking to, to broaden their uh, range of uh, uh, suppliers, uh, emerging market champions looking to diversify uh, their asset base, or sovereign wealth funds uh, looking for somewhere to park their money. Another issue we're likely to see um, is that, uh, that the challenge of striking a balance uh, between international investors and mineral host countries will become increasingly challenging, as if it wasn't uh, challenging enough already. Global miners will have to learn to operate in this more political world of negotiation and trust. They will not be able to rely on rule-based systems and written contracts to the degree to which probably uh, they would like. They will instead need not to think of themselves just as builders of mines, but as collaborators in the uh, economic and social development of the countries where they're operating. For which purpose they will need to inform themselves far better perhaps than they've needed to in the past about those countries they're operating in, their history, their culture, and their politics. These were not, this, this is something which suggests something of a shift in terms of the skill set that mining companies will need to avail themselves of. These are not necessarily the kind of skills that are made for managerial success in the mining industry in the past. And in assessing what it is the companies need to do, they maybe need to listen slightly less than they have done in the past to the international organizations who have pondered on the question of what uh, developing uh, mineral-rich host countries need, and rather more on what those countries are actually saying they want. And we've already had reference to uh, the African Mining Vision, uh, which is a good place for companies to start in informing themselves about where it is the host countries are coming from and how they see uh, mineral industry 
integrated into their broader social and economic objectives. Obviously, uh, the mining industry is already uh, moving towards some of this at a different, some country, companies more advanced uh, than others, but a cursory inspection of companies' uh, websites will tell you that all of them are trying to grapple with this issue. Um, of some interest in this context is the work that the um, ICMM uh, has been doing, and I believe they have a, um, a meeting here to discuss this Thursday, but I was very struck by this uh, statement in a, a report that they produced last year that, that uh, tried to encapsulate a shift in thinking away from a narrow um, interpretation of sustainability as being the sustainability of the industry to being uh, a broader uh, um, uh, sustainable development agenda. I quote, uh, the focus is not now on how mining can be sustainable and how mining, minerals and metals can contribute to sustainable development. This is a conceptual shift away from a singular analysis and mitigation of impacts to a more comprehensive analysis that looks at the wider contribution of the industry and its products. The focus on contribution is a tougher but fairer approach. This is so because it demands a demonstration of positive results and not just mitigation of negative impacts. But if the mining industry has a lot to do, then, it, and it has a lot to do, um, then it can only do so much on its own. It also needs a partner who understands where it is coming from and the pressures that it is subject to and is sensitive to uh, the constituencies that the industry itself has to satisfy. Companies uh, can only attract risk capital to the extent that they can persuade investors that their projects are worthy of support and that these are things that, th that these are good use to which to put the investors money. Clearly projects uh, need to be economically attractive but they also need to be based on clear, transparent guidelines and there needs to be some expectation that those guidelines will um, remain in place sufficiently long for the investors to recover their capital. It's not just that mining companies have other places to go, it's that their investors have other places to go. They don't need to invest in mining, they can invest in Apple, they can invest in property, they can invest in fizzy drinks. As the Deutsche Bank research that I quoted earlier makes the point, the investing community is not a happy place uh, for the mining industry at the moment. They feel shortchanged by the benefits they, uh, they derive from uh, the boom and they're coming down pretty heavily on companies now uh, that show a tendency to waste their capital. So companies are coming under pressure from the investing community as well. A pressure which can be illustrated by, um, for example, global uh, equity raisings uh, over the last few years fallen away quite dramatically, particularly if you take out of that chart the effects of the big three. If you look at the smaller companies, the juniors and intermediates, similar kind of picture here with um, the financings dropping back to the sort of levels they were immediately after the global financial crisis. And certainly uh, what I hear around the place uh, talking with people is that there isn't really an expectation that this is going to get much easier in 2013. In fact, uh, city analysts' uh, figures that I've, that I've looked at suggest they expect CapEx in 2013 to fall significantly relative to that of 2012 and to fall again in 2014. The investment boom uh, has largely passed. Resource nationalism clearly has strong negative connotations for investors. One can't quibble with the right of companies, countries to dispose of their uh, resources as they see fit. And in fact, in many respects, what the resource-rich countries are doing now is no more reprehensible in its own way than what consuming countries have been doing to secure their own supplies of raw materials. But these policies do have consequences. They have consequences for investors. They have consequences for the economics of projects. They have in consequences for global supply, but they also have consequences for the producing countries themselves. If 
the conditions on investors are set so tight that the companies, that in foreign investors go away and there aren't local investors who can step in, into, the place, into that place, then nothing has been gained. Minerals in the ground have no economic value uh, whatsoever. You could argue that they might be there for development in 20 or 30 years' time. They may or they may not have value in 20 or 30 years' time, but the point is that there's a whole generation that has missed out on the opportunity that those resources presented to develop wealth. The same applies with respect to beneficiation. The competitive advantages of mining are not necessarily the competitive advantages of smelting. Mining focus very much on resource quality, infrastructure. The competitive advantage in smelting is more to do with power availability, technology, skills and so on. Sometimes these occur in the same countries, sometimes they don't occur in the same countries. So there can be no presumption that going downstream beneficiation necessarily contributes towards the local economy. There's a lot of talk about value adding, but I point out that value added is an accounting concept. It's just the difference between the inputs to a project and the revenues from its sales. What one should be thinking about is wealth creation. And wealth creation has to take account not just the value added, but the capital expense of creating that gap. It's not something that can just be written off and forgotten about. Otherwise, what may be value adding may actually be wealth destroying. And countries need to be very clear on what it is they're doing and why they're doing it. Anyhow, yeah, okay, timed it well in that case. To conclude, since I'm, I uh, uh, guess I've, uh, tested your patience uh, sufficiently. Uh, we are moving into a world where producers and consumers are becoming progressively more polarized. This and um, the increasing role state involvement in the minerals industry is creating a much more politicized industry. Through their actions, producers and consumers are forcing investment and production into channels which better suit their their interests, and this is reshaping mineral supply in ways that I hope I've been able to describe to you. As a free market economist, I can't say I'm that enthusiastic with this prospect, but I accept it uh, for what it is, and it's not going to reverse any time soon. As a political scientist, I see this as a world full of interesting challenges and possibilities. It's untidy, it's messy, it's be demanding, but there will be opportunities out there for those who can figure out what is going on and who are prepared to work to get the benefit of them. Thank you very much for your attention. Right, ladies and gentlemen, um, thanks very much indeed. Uh, that was absolutely fantastic. I, I think. Um, um, as we move to this managing the new mercantilism uh, that David's talking about, uh, yeah, trying to get your mind around that and trying to get your voice around it is quite interesting. But I think it's a, it's a very interesting um, what, thing that companies are obviously having to get their minds around. How does one question I'm going to start off with, we're going to take just a couple of quick questions. And uh, are there any hands in the audience? Um, just very quickly while we're thinking about it. Um, uh, obviously, governments themselves, whilst trying to play a bigger role in relation to resource nationalism, uh, trying to impose conditions for beneficiation, etc., perhaps the question to you, David, is governments also need to play the role of trying to provide the enabling, facilitating environments, not just around mineral supply, but also the sort of industrial policy type incentives which can allow certain things like beneficiation to take place. What are your thoughts? Uh... Yes, I mean, these are, these are broad uh, development, development questions, and it, 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 one's conscious that, that one's looking at one, a microcosm of some, some much broader uh, development issues. I mean, one of the areas that, that I was uh, uh, very keen to see uh, developed whilst uh, working in, in Rio, and I'm very happy to see that the company has, 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 has gone a long way um, in taking these, this sort of thinking forward is in relation to, to regional economic development and seeing mining really as uh, an aspect of regional economic development. Now, as companies 
often point out, they're not themselves development agencies, uh, and that's absolutely right. I mean, companies can't stray too far from the remit of satisfying investments and, and, and digging holes in the ground, uh, but they can co-opt uh, the support of those whose function it is to do these things and to work in association to support them uh, with expertise uh, and finance, and I think that there is a great scope in that area. Um, I, I'm not uh, myself particularly knowledgeable about the, 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 the policy aspect from the government's point of view, from the point of view of the company, I think this is a very productive area in which the, uh, the two need to start working together more closely. Okay, any questions out there? Any questions? No? No takers? Thank you very much indeed. Too far away, I can't see. Where? Ah, run. Right here. Okay. She's hiding behind the cameraman. Yeah, she's not hiding. The camera is hiding here. <laughs> um, Thanks. You know, you're talking about a whole mindset shift in your presentation. It is very interesting, but I'm wondering if you have thought of a timeline. You've taken us from the 1600s to the 2000 to today. What do you think will be the timeline for all these stakeholders to come to this, to me, wonderful game? Timeline, yes. Actually, I think I, think I went, went back even further than uh, the 1700s. I went back to... Uh, uh, but, um, look, uh, I think um, the industry has had this huge surge in, in, in its de in demand for its, for its products, a huge surge in prices, um, a wave of investment. Uh, I, I think there's a lot of uncertainty over exactly what happens next. Um, uh, but I think that in some respects there is some benefit in this because it, it does uh, give um, all parties to, to, to the industry an opportunity to kind of uh, stand back from the kind of pell-mell of, of decision taking that kind of overtook them uh, well, whilst the, the industry was very strong and it was still in thrall to the super cycle. I think there is an opportunity now. Some of the pressure is off companies to plow you know, investment in the new projects pretty much irrespective of what it costs them to do it. Um, and uh, at the same time, I think uh, from, the, from the perspective of the, uh, the, the host countries, maybe uh, we need to see a little bit of kind of uh, realism uh, adjustment to the fact that we're not really in those high price periods. I mean, there's quite a, quite a noticeable lag, I notice, uh, between the, the high point of prices and uh, the high point of resource nationalism. There does seem to be a bit of a lag there. Uh, so maybe we're still seeing some of the kind of the backwash from, from earlier price effects. But I do think that uh, both sides now have an opportunity to kind of sit down and decide where they want to be in 20 years' time. Um, and I think it, that uh, debate is likely to be more realistic now than it might have been, you know, four or five years ago when prices were so much higher. But I'm not making any forecasts about where we're going to be in 50 years' time. That would be someone else's problem. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, that's uh, David Humphreys. Thanks very much to him. Round of applause, please.